everybody. My name is Joanne Tan. I am a Royal Crown Diamond from Hong Kong. And uh, if you have heard me speak before at the other past online symposium, you may know who I am. If not, then you would have to go back and rewatch all of those online symposium videos. So this is the fourth one that I've done. Um, the first one I did was four years ago. Was it four or five years ago? The first time that Dr. Oliver Winker decided to do this online symposium. And I talked about um, Chinese medicine, when Chinese medicine crossed over with essential oils. And we talked about the time of the day and how uh, uh, our meridian and our chi actually works um, according to the time of the day and what essential oils to use for them. And my second online symposium workshop was about uh, meridian and essential oils and how to support different organs and how these different organs interrelate and how we can do use by using massage and applying essential oils onto our skin, how we can balance our body and support our uh, different organs so that they can function as that optimal. And last year, my seat to seal, uh, last year, my in online symposium was on um, Gary Young because I wrote a book about him and it talked mostly about seat to seal, about the stories that I've followed Gary around the world. I've been traveling with him for six years, uh, I met him back in 2011 uh, when they opened the Singapore office. I am from Hong Kong. It's about Hong Kong is about four hours flight from Singapore, and uh, that's when I first met him. And since then, I have traveled with him maybe four, five, six times a year since um, until he got sick in uh, 19, uh, 2017 and eventually passed away. Unfortunately, uh, May. 2018, and I actually wrote a book about this, all the stories and all the things that I've learned from him. I've been to nearly all of the farms that allow visitors, except the one in Oman. Uh, so I'm actually currently now at our Fort Nelson farm up in Fort, um, uh, Canada, up in northern part of Canada. This is our Black Spruce, Northern Lights Black Spruce Farm is in Fort Nelson. Fort Nelson is a little town of 1,000 to 2,000 residents. Um, it used to be a town of gas and oil industry and lumber industry, but a lot of that have moved out of this town. So now um, there are only about 1,000 people who live here. And um, back when we uh, uh, ran out of Black Spruce in uh, 2013, I don't know if any of you were in, with the company back then, and uh, we were out of black spruce, so we were out of a lot of the different blends. I think, if I remember correctly, 38 blends, including RC, Motivation, Valor, Peace and Calming. And Valor has a lot of black spruce in it. Um, and all of this behind me, you see all of these are black spruce. We have enough black spruce to feed, to use uh, for three generations, and for every one Black spruce tree we harvest, we replant three of them. So you don't have to worry about sustainability. Young Living is really adamant about making sure that everything is sustainable in this company. And uh, we were going, we were out harvesting yesterday and we were talking to the local people, the workers who work on our farm. Uh, all of these people have lived in Fort Nelson nearly all their lives and they know this black spruce trees really well. And I asked them about, um, harvesting the trees, they say, you know, some of these trees are blocking the sunlight, and if we cut them down, uh, we actually allow sunlight for the younger trees. And um, so they're totally okay with it because we have mountains of it. And um, so I'm actually here to talk about seed to seal. This is going to be the topic of this lecture. Dr. Oliver Winker has kindly allowed me to talk about, choose my own topic. Um, seek to seal the quality of a company, something that I'm very, very passionate about. Uh, I've been honored to be awarded the 5x5 five five Pledge Development Farm Award. Last year at convention, it's the first time they've ever had an award like that. Um, they told me that because I am a leader who has brought in many, many of our members who have participated in Harvest. And um, I come here Every year, I go to winter harvest every year. It's, I started with Idaho and St. Maurice, and now I'm here in Fort Nelson. The first time I really worked shoulder to shoulder with Gary was um, 2014. Um, 
no, it was 2013, actually, 2013, the winter harvest in Idaho. And I was saying Maurice Farm and, and our Highland Sat Farm. It changed my life. I can talk about that in another time because today I'm going to talk to you about Seed to Seal and about this farm. So I'm here. It's beautiful. We hand harvest and we machine harvest. And then we distill the oils and um, well, we harvest them and then we chip them. So let me show you. Uh, I'll bring you to a little bit of distillery tour first before I start with the lecture. So that you all get an idea and get a glimpse of what we actually do here. Uh, we are true farm farmer first company and members first company. We do actually have our own farms, um, 24 worldwide. I think if I remember the number correctly, I've been to 12 or 14 of them. I lost count already. Um, so I'm here in the distillery. It's now four o'clock and because during the winter festival, I'm here for the winter festival. And uh, the farm only starts operating at night because so that we can coincide with watching the lights on the outside. And somebody's cleaning now. It's uh, nearly three o'clock and um, they're getting ready for the day. So when we come in here, I'm going to show you. We're going to cut the, we usually cut the trees down and then we send them through a chipper. Uh, for those of you who lives on the farm and who works with lumber would know how that works. And then we come in here. We unload the chips in a semi through those doors. And actually, the semi just fits. Gary made it, measured it so that it actually just fits. The rooftop of this is much higher than the other um, the story that you've been. If you've been to uh, Utah at convention, you will see that the distillation farm, the, the distillery, is actually open door. Um, so over there, all these are exposed. These are the cookers. These are the gigantic monster cookers that Gary designed. Gary designed all of our cookers. And this is half filled with black fruit. They need to be packed properly. I'll talk about it a little bit um, during the lecture. I just want to show you what everything is. This is actually empty and how deep it is. It's Okay, this is 20 feet deep. Yes, and uh, Gary designed it. It's the largest essential oil cooker in North America. Uh, we started, he started off with small cookers like this, if you can compare, if you can see. But it's not, it doesn't, uh, it's not enough for our, our, uh, uh, demand. So he started planning and thinking of building these. The first gigantic monster cooker was built in Idaho, Highland Flats, because back then we didn't have a display up there. Now we do. And, uh, so we have two, one of the small ones. You have the big one and one test cooker. This is a smaller test cooker. Well, we have two even smaller cookers down there. I'm going to show you. Um, maybe I can bring you down and take a look. So after we filled and stomped on the chips, We would have to put the steam through. I will bring you down so that you can take a look. Uh -huh. Isn't this the best place to do a seat to seal lecture with Dr. Ollie's online symposium? All right, so now we've walked down. You can see down there, it's actually where the oil come out. It's very quiet now. That's why they let me come in um, before they actually start distillation so that I can record this. Normally, this Stainless steel is glass. When you go to St. Marie's or, or Idaho, Highland Flats, you will see that this is glass. This is actually the condenser. It's when the steam comes through, through the uh, cookers, and then the steam will bring through, let's see how I get, okay, here. The steam will go through and uh, work through all of those plant material and bring them through this hose down. And the steam will carry the essential oils from the plant and it will go through this condenser and when it goes through the condenser it comes down there are cold water tubes and so when steam 
uh, it's cold. It's, it, it reduces temperature. It becomes liquid, right? And this was originally designed as glass because Gary wanted the visitors to see how the oil and the water comes out. You can actually see the oil come out when the oil is separating from the water. It's called, um, I forgot uh, what it's called, but anyway, um, pass over. It's called passing over. So when it's pass over, you can actually see oil and water separating. But now, because they've changed this to stainless steel, because the weather is too harsh here, it's too cold outside, and the steam this is too hot, so it keeps breaking. And they have replaced it several times, but it's still breaking, so now they have to use stainless steel. Um, so we can't see through that, but I can bring you down. It's awfully quiet here, and you can see how clean it is. Gary was very, very strict about how everything needs to be kept spotless, even after every fill. So everybody has to keep cleaning and sweeping the floor. So this was from yesterday, from last night. So the oil would come down through the condenser, along with the floral water, down this pipe, okay, down this pipe, into what this is called a separator. Let me stand farther away, then you can all see. That's a separator. And so the floral water is below. And it's actually called hydrosol. Floral water is diluted hydrosol. So the hydrosol would be below, and it's heavier than oil, than the essential oil, and the essential oil will float on top, just like here. These have already been extracted. These have been taken out, and um, these are the oil. Usually, it goes up to about here, and um, you will see that the oil actually comes out of the floral water, the hydrosol, in bubbles, and the bubbles would burst, and then. When the time and every batch, I mean, every plant requires a different uh, temperature, pressure, and time in order to extract the best quality. We don't extract the most, we extract the best. And uh, after that, they stop it, and then the oil is taken out of from here, go down, and come out of here. Okay? And they go all go into stainless steel drums like those, okay? Every oil that we distill, everything that we use in all our distilleries and all our farms are all uh, the oil, the, on, the, thing that, the only thing that the oil will touch is glass and stainless steel. Gary was very, very adamant and very strict about that. And everything is turned off now, and this is the boiler, boiler room. Usually it's, restrict, it's restricted because it's really hot, and now I can come in because it's off. Awesome. They always have to keep that door open because it's so hot in here. That's a gigantic boiler. And we're just talking to uh, Kevin LaRose here, who is the distillery manager. Oh, here he is, talking about the man himself. <laughs> and is there, do you know if there's another boiler like this in the whole of Canada? Uh, I'm sure there's lots, uh -huh. but, but there's really one thing that's one. completely different about our boiler than any uh -huh. other boiler in Canada, uh -huh. is that ours has no chemicals in it. Oh. The main point. What's the what's usually what, pe what do people use for these? Um, use what's the purpose of the boiler? Um, like heating. Um, I know a lot of like textile companies use them. Yeah, nice. Universities use them to, to oh, heat their awful. entire facility. Oh. Uh, chemicals. Do, uh, I mean, why would people put chemicals? Um, for oxygen scavenging. So the more oxygen you have in your water, the more likely it is to rust and corrode, um, and that can be damaging to the boiler. Um, another one is for scale. Um, mm. So what that is, is it's basically a hard layer that forms on the tubes. Um, and the thicker layer of scale you have, the less heat transfer there is from the, the fire to the water to create the steam. So the more you build up, the more likely you are to have a failure in the boiler. Um, there's a bunch of other ones. Um, phosphates, sulfates, um, flocculants. Um, what those are is basically even though the water coming in is filtered, there's always gonna be a little bit of debris that comes in with it. So the flocculants, what they do is they make them attractive to each other. So they'll bunch together and then fall to the bottom of the boiler. So your boiler's not, you know, doesn't build up with dirty water. Mm -hmm. So when you steam it, all that um, debris is gonna be left behind and your steam's gonna go clean. Um, so after a while, you can get a dirty layer in your boiler. So we empty it out 
every couple months and fill it back up. Um, but we have to do a few different things um, because we're not using chemicals. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, what do we do? So every six months we have to shut the boiler down for a week, um, drain it and open up. Like these are the manholes, or sorry, the hand holes, <laughs> the manholes. holes. Um, I gotta take like that plug off that pipe. So basically we gotta inspect the entire internals of the boiler and make sure that scale isn't building up, um, rust isn't building up in there. Um, just as a safety precaution, um, because we don't use those chemicals in there, that can accelerate that process. Um, so we just retube this, which is basically opening it up, cutting out all the tubes inside there. There's 178 tubes in there, I believe. Um, so we had to cut every single one out, put brand new tubes in there. Um, we did that February of 2017. A week before distributor harvest. Oh, a week before we came. Yay! So it was still going on a little bit when the first group got here, but by the second group we had it we had it all closed up and buttoned up. So it was a it was a stressful couple of weeks um, because we couldn't make oil during those weeks. Um, but now that those fresh tubes are in there, our boiler's good for minimum five years before we even have to start worrying about it again. We do do a little bit of water treatment, um, and the only thing we really do is, is put it through a water softener, um, and that'll take out a lot of that scaling. Um, hard water basically is what causes that. Um, and that's basically what it does, it takes out the calcium and the magnesium out of the water and replaces it with sodium. So sodium is soluble in water, it'll carry through in steam, and it, it's basically salt. Um, whereas the calcium and the magnesium produce that hard scale, mm -hmm. which can affect the boiler's um, efficiency. Mm -hmm. um, and after a long period of time, that can really do some, some damage to it. That's an amazing information to have. But, because, yes. I mean, with chemicals, mm -hmm. I mean, when we told our regulatory body, um, so we got the Technical Safety BC, which kind of regulates boilers. Um, so when we told him, our, our inspector, that we weren't putting chemicals in there, his arms flew up in the air and red flags got up, because he never heard of a boiler not being run with chemicals before. And um, basically we told him if we have to shut the boiler down every year and gut it and rebuild it every year, that's what we'll do. Because as soon as we put chemicals in here, we can't use this boiler. I remember Gary told me that. Yeah. When he was setting this up, he could not find an inspector who knows how to inspect a boiler that yeah. has no chemicals in it. Exactly. He had to teach him. So, That's so, why I asked that question just now. So what we had to do originally is every three months open it up. Mm. Um, and then we did that for two years. Um, and we made reports. So every three months, I had to write a 30-page report wow. with pictures and send that in to him so he can review it and make sure we are still safe with our boiler. Um, and then after two years, we got that extended to six months. So before, every three months, so we'd have to shut it down for about a week. And then if he was on holidays or something, when I sent my report in, I'd have to wait for him to get back because I couldn't close it up before he got, you know, gave me his little check mark. Um, so that usually would affect us for one week in our season. So our season's only six months long. Um, so we would have to shut down for a week in the middle of our season. Um, so we finally got him to agree to six months. So now we can run our full season without having to shut down for a week um, and stop making oil, stop production. Um, and now we can go till the end of our season. Then we can shut it down, inspect it, and then fire it back up after that. I remember Gary told us that when he was setting up the farm, this was the reason why the distillation had to be um, deferred, because they wouldn't approve the boiler without chemicals. There was a lot of red tape we had to cut through, and um, one of those conditions was the three months um, inspection, is that the only way they would let us turn it on is, okay, after three months, open it up, and we'll prove to you that we could run it without chemicals. Because again, they'd never seen a boiler run without chemicals before. Mm -hmm. Usually, you know, when, when he first came in, he said, okay, well, where's your chemical injection port? Because usually, you know, there's a pipe on the side that goes right into the boiler and that just, all day long, that just injects chemicals in there. So yeah, when I we didn't have one, um, 
and we had to convince him yeah. that it was, you know, the way we had to You know, when Gary told me, I didn't understand. I only knew the concept, but now that he explained to me, because I remember he said we, the farm was actually ready to distill at the end of September, mm -hmm. but we couldn't because of the boiler issue, and the guy was on holiday, and da da da. so he started inspecting, and... October, but we couldn't fire it up because we had to wait October, November, and December. Eventually, at the end of January, we could run it, right? We got our permit. Well, we could run it for testing. Yes, yes, not in for January. Testing. So we finally got our permit on March 18th of 2015. That was my first day of work. Uh, so that was that was the when we first got our uh, operating permit and we were allowed to run it. Yeah. And today um, is the 16th. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. That's tomorrow, tomorrow is probably yeah. Yeah. five years. Exactly. Yeah. Anniversary. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> oh wow. Yeah. Well, that was a, well. That was why we had questions for it. That's amazing because <laughs> this is such important information to send out to it the is, world. Yeah. Because nobody understands this, mm -hmm. and people always talk about how. Well, how do you prove that you don't have chemicals? What's the difference? So we talk about the water, we talk about the gas, we talk about the distillation, and every single part of it, it I always said that it takes Gary at least two hours to explain why our products are better, mm -hmm. at least from growing from the seed to the soil to the water that watered the farm and to the what we put into the, the soil and all of that, until really the ceiling part. It's incredible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're very welcome. <laughs> So he was just telling us how this boiler has no chemicals in it. We are not allowed to put chemicals in. However, when we had to register the, the this boiler here in Canada, the person who came to inspect the boiler did not know how to inspect it because they have never heard of anybody who do not use chemicals in the boilers. So what do they use these chemicals for? They use it to make sure that it's just descaling, make sure that there's no heavy chemical deposits in the machine, in the boiler, because of how hard the water is, and uh, to uh, prevent it from rusting. And I remember Gary told me that he actually had to teach the examiner who how to how it can be done without rusting and scaling, right? So what we have to do is we have to stop production every three months for about a week or two to assemble the whole thing and take out all the pipes inside and clean it, and make sure all, nothing, uh, there's no scaling, there's no rusting, and every five years, everything inside needs to be changed. And so when Gary was setting this farm up, I remember he told us that he can start the filling in um, October because he's already set everything, but ended up it was deferred because of this boiler issue. And they needed the, the they needed to make sure that um, the boiler without any chemicals is actually a feasible idea and we had to keep the boiler running for three months without distillation and I remember Gary was very very upset about it we had to keep it running for three months and then show them that uh, it's still working very well and it's very clean and there's no scaling deposit and there's no rusting and then before they would need to test our boiler every three months now they allow us to have them come in to test it for every six months because we've shown them that it works. This distillery has been in operation since 2015. The first distillation was in March 2015. And then, um, so after, that was the boiler room. And then after the oil is taken out, it will be, well, we'll take a sample for it to test. And all of our farms have a testing lab with the GCMS in there. And this is the decanting room. There's Frank in there. There's Frank in there. Maybe I can go in. So to show all of you, let me show them what I'm doing. I'm recording the video for the online symposium. Yes. And uh, I'm just going around showing this is going to be shown to the world. <laughs> and, <laughs> so this is the perfect day to be in the decanting room because it's nearly 3.40, the perfect time to see the northern lights inside your eyes through the oil itself. There's something that's very magical that our decanter Frank here has found out, has discovered. And so um, I'm here with Frank and these are distributors from the US, right? Alabama, 
all three of you? Washington, okay. Well, I'm from Hong Kong. Anyway, I was just interrupting them. They were just chatting in here and looking at how this, these oils are being filtered. Well, Gary called them filtering. We call them decanting. It's the same thing. It's sort of like decanting a bottle of wine. Gary has found out that he's tried out many, many different ways to filter them. And I'll explain in a moment why you need to filter them. And we found out that unbleached coffee filters work the best. And you know what? We always ask them to keep these coffee filters for us when we're visiting because they are the best facial mask. Because they have absorbed all those amazing essential oils and all the nutrients that are in the floral water and the oil. And can you imagine, Mr. Frank here actually filters every batch of black spruce oil. So if you have a black but a bottle of black spruce oil in your home, it has been filtered through these hands. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> we love him. Yes, we love Frank. He is like the best, loving, most loving, most caring person in the whole entire world. And you have to come here and visit him and give him a hug. <laughs> well, I'm leave you to leave you guys now and go back out there. Um, thank you, thank you, guys. All righty. Okay, let's go outside and I'm gonna bring you out and show you where we dispose of the plant material that has been steamed. And I'll bring you into the lab too, okay? So after the plant materials have been steamed, distilled, they will be unloaded. <laughs> After the plant materials have been steamed, distilled, they will be unloaded, unloaded from one of these using that crane, that, it will be pulled up, all these chains will be hooked onto all these chains, these ones, ah, will be hooked onto that, and these doors here will be open up, and it will pull it out. And we will dump. <laughs> I'm going to go out. It will be dumped right here. Right here. And then they will be brought. All these plant material will be brought to the other side of our farm where we have a workshop and a pellet plant. And these chips will be made into little pellets. And uh, it will be given to the local people to burn as fuel for to warm the houses and these actually still smell nice these plant steam plant material still smell good um so we don't gary has found out the best way to distill it in a certain period of time so a lot of times these plant materials still smell really nice look at that amazing view you guys all have to come here and take a look at this farm because last night we saw the northern lights they were out we actually believe that there are northern lights every night. It's just because we can't see them. It doesn't mean that they don't exist. And uh, I stayed up until 4 o'clock taking photos of the light. And then, um, let me see. Oh, let me bring you to the lab too. And this is actually just the first part of this uh, seat to seal lecture. I'm going to be talking about my presentation in a moment. Um, but first, I would like to bring you to the lab and meet our lab tech, Wes, who has worked with Gary since Gary started building this distillery. All right, let's see. Mr. Wes is cleaning the floor. <laughs> I'm doing a recording for the online symposium. This recording is gonna go to the world, and this is Wes here. He is our lab tech. He helps test every batch of black spruce oil that is still still in this farm in this lab and we have a gc maybe you can talk a little bit about what they what you talk about when um, people come through this in the tour yeah. 
Down on the side of a, a glass user, and inside there's a little space, it's very hot. So once that sample goes down in there, the heat breaks that oil apart into all those separate components. From there it goes down into uh, called a capillary column. It's, can't open it right now because it's too hot. I, just, I have two of these hanging in there. So what this does, it just looks like a wire, but it's hollow inside. Mm -hmm. and so it is uh, a quarter of a micron, so it's actually about the size of like human hair inside. And your sample vapor starts to run through it. As it runs through, it reacts with the coating inside. And what happens is all your separate compounds start to gather together and then start to move apart. So as it's going through, all your different uh, chemicals in there start to get further and further apart. And that's the whole basis behind chromatography is separation. You take a whole part, separate it until it's all its simplest parts, study it in its, in its entirety. Now this is, what's the limitation of this machine as compared to an MS? is that this can count uh, the charges of the atoms, whereas uh, an MS will actually measure out each part of that atom and weigh it subatomically. So it's very much more precise than this one. After it's finished traveling through the column, it'll come up through this last part here. So that's called a detector. Inside there is a oxygen and hydrogen flame to burn it very, very hot. And as soon as the carbon atoms pass through it, carbon atoms gain a charge and it ionizes. And then the detector picks up the charge of those ions and, and uh, quantifies it, so it counts it. In that way, we know how much of that sample is in there. And the computer, it computes how long it took for it to uh, travel through the column. So what we get is called a chromatic graph. Well, on the bottom is your time scale, and on the left side is your intensity. So it'll tell us when the first compound came out and then how much of it was. So the way these are geared is when you're completing your chemical table, and you take a known chemical, you study it, you mark down its retention time, and then every time that chemical comes through again, you can identify that as one certain compound. One of the tricky parts is, is some of these really like to stick together because chemically they're very similar. So it's really hard to separate them. And they can get confused on the computer and they can actually misidentify certain chemicals. So I had to study uh, black spruce for a long time to know that um, if that little peak there doesn't show up, then it's obviously become part of a bigger peak and the percentage is gonna be incorrect. Uh, so it's my job still, I have to go back through and make sure the mistakes are correct. But this does save me a lot of time. Uh, at the very beginning when I was uh, doing the testing, I had to go back through each time to re-identify. It took me about an hour and a half to do each test. Uh, cut it down to uh, 15 minutes, so it saved me a lot of time. So, uh, pretty useful. Once I have a library of certain compounds that I've been able to uh, verify what they are, uh, I can use uh, different oils, uh, say nutmeg. I can put a sample of nutmeg in there and it'll identify those compounds in there as well because I already have that in my library. So as the years go on, my library is going to get bigger and bigger and more flexible my testing can be. This is actually a system that gets better with age. <laughs> The longer that uh, you work it, the more chemicals you have, um, the wider range of testing you can do. And that's becomes just more accurate you know, over time as you use it. And our company has 30 years of experience and 30 years worth of um, lab records, right? Yes. So, yeah, it's pretty amazing. Well, that's actually represented. Uh, this is Young Living's uh, retention index. This is a library of the chemicals that they've uh, produced. And then their scientists, uh, yeah, you can't, you can't actually record the results. So, <laughs> uh, so what this does, it gives me a wealth of information, a uh, library that I can use for reference. Uh, so if I have a question about something that's unknown, I can come back and, and uh, go through it. And at least it'll point me in the right direction. But it's taken many, many years uh, to be able to create this own index. And uh, 
Yeah, it's been very helpful. Yeah, we have the largest index in the world for essential oils. This is only just part of it. Yes, I know that we have three million entries. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I probably only have uh, maybe four thousand in here. Yeah. 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 Then, oh look, we've got hand label oil testing right here. <laughs> There's so much secret in this place. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Wes. Thank you. So that's um, sort of like the end of a tour. I'm going to keep be talking about um, my presentation properly in a moment. And uh, I hope you all enjoy a tour of this amazing distillery that Gary built. And... Um, you all need to come here and experience it because just looking through and meeting people online isn't the same as meeting them in person, right? And um, you know what? Let me bring you down to the back and look at that. Uh, let me see. And I, I'm going to be talking a little bit more about testing um, because our testing, the way that we test our oils in this company is different than the other companies. Um, let me walk through to the back. It's quite amazing there too. This view is amazing. It's really quiet. Nobody's here. I want to show you something. We were hand harvesting yesterday. So we're on our way to uh, hand harvesting the trees. And we're on skidoos, sort of like a snowmobile, what people would call. The local people call it a skidoo. And that's my car. We're heading towards the part of the farm to harvest the black spruce trees by hand. The small ones that we harvest by hand. The large ones we do have machines, but um, we can't go into the large ones machines now because the ground is very muggy and muddy uh, because it's not as cold as it normally is. So they can only go in at 5 o'clock in the morning when the ground is still frozen. And they will harvest them. So the reason why we come out in the winter time is it's nice and hard, it's frozen, we can bring the machines, we can bring the heavy equipment onto it, um, and it's basically just like a big road. And then in the summer you cannot bring anything heavy in, right? No, so that water underneath, it could be two inches thick, deep, it could be 20 feet deep, oh. you never know. No, that's it's just a root system. Guys, you're on the fuel bike right now. Right. But then if you just take and squeeze out, just so oh, you can... Wow. Hey. Oh, wow. So like, I mean... That's why when you yeah. expose any part of it, it's mm -hmm. just water. It's literally just water and roots. Like, there's no stuff. Um, so you run the risk of uh, sinking pretty deep if yeah. you're not in the right spot. Right. But you can walk and animals can come in. Oh, yes. So that's how yeah. nature has made it. Uh -huh. So that light animals and humans can walk through, but yeah. not machines. Yes. <laughs> Hello. So we're now, I'm now at the um, Blacksworth Farm. We are doing hand harvest. Uh, we just have two people today and they still brought us out here and I'm going to record a video of uh, how it is being cut down by hand. We've got Kevin and Seth here helping us out. Hello. And we came out in skidoos. We want to cut down a tree like this. So when we're doing our black spruce, we want to cut trees down that are in this general height because they're the best for the world. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. And how old would that tree be? She's about 15. Mm. 15 years old. 15 mm. to 20 to 30. Ah, okay. All right. Just, just clear some of the snow mm -hmm. so we can get the majority. Get your saw in there. Mm -hmm. Then you'll hold your tree and take your saw and just go back and forth. And you do that. Mm -hmm. Slanted or sideways? Flat's better because mm -hmm. if someone else is working with you and it's on an angle like this and they trip and fall, it can cut them. Mm -hmm. So I always cut trees flat straight across the bottom. Oh, I see. Okay. And then it doesn't hurt if someone falls or trips over it. And mm -hmm. Okay, that safety. makes sense. Safety first. Okay. So would you like to come and... Give it a go. Give go. your okay. tree cut and a go. Okay. <laughs> oh 
And we noticed that if we thank the tree before we thank the tree before we cut yes. it down, they actually cut easier. So maybe we'd have to thank this tree for giving us oils that we'll bring to the rest of the world and help them. So Kevin, how do we know how old a tree is? So after you cut your tree down, you wipe off all the sawdust and wood shavings and you start at the center and you count the rings. So we start with the center, that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty one, twenty two, twenty three, twenty four, twenty five, twenty six, twenty seven, twenty eight, right? Twenty seven. I'm ready to take my finger. Oh, this one. Yeah. So, so this one. Right there. Oh, okay, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, 59, 60, 61, 62, 63, 64, 65, 66, 67, 68, 69, 70, 71, 72, 73, 74, 75, 76, 77, 78, 79, 80, 81, 82, 83, 84, 85, 86, 87, 88, 89, 90, 91, 92, 93, 94, 95, 96, 97, 98, 99, 100, 101, 102, 103, 104, 105, 106, 107, 108, 109, 110, 111, 112, 113, 114, 115, 116, 117, 118, 119, 120, 121, 122, 123, 124, 125, 126, 127, 128, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 90, 91, 92, 93, 94, 95, 96, 97, 98, 99, 100, 101, 102, 103, 104, 105, 106, 107, 108, 109, 90, 91, 92, 93, 94, 95, 96, 97, 98, 99, 100, 101, 102, 103, 104, 105, 106, 107, 108, 99, 90, 91, 92, 93, 94, 95, 96, 97, 98, 99, 100, 101, 102, 103, 104, 105, 106, 107, 108, 99, 90, 91, 102, 103, 104, 105, 106, 107, 108, 99, 100, 101, 102, 103, 104, 105, 106, 107, 108, 99, 100, 101, 102, 103, 104, 105, 106, 107, 108, 99, 100, 101, 102, 103, 104, 105, 106, 107, 108, 99, I hope that uh, I'll be able to put the hand harvesting video in here so that you can see. And these are the trees that we hand harvested yesterday. We actually went out to the farm, to the forest, and uh, hand harvested th these trees. This one, I had a tree that was so big that I had to be cut in two. And so this is actually the testing chipper. So and here we are hand chipping the trees that we have harvested during that day. Normally they won't allow children on the field like this, but because Audrey, it's um, she goes to the to the farm all the time, so and she's really eager to help, and we can't really say no to a little girl. So and here's the Jesse distiller. It's usually for testing small batches, especially when we're testing new plants. And we will fill it up like how we would do a normal distillery. And then we will put water in and we will wait for the steam to come out. And now this is the hydrosol that is coming out. And you can slowly see that the water comes out first, just like how we would normally do the distillation. And you will also see the oil coming out during Passover in a moment. And later on, you'll see that when that um, hydrosol fill up, you will see that it will come out into the measuring jar and the oil is floating on the top. And uh, later on, you'll see that Wes, our lab tech, whom you have met previously in the video, he will be taking some oils out and uh, test them first. So that's how we test every single batch of our oils and make sure that they are of the highest and purest quality.